Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert Series. I'm Dorian Mincer. I'm your host and owner of Revolutionize Retirement. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guest, Dr. Louise Aronson, who is both a medical doctor as well as has a master's in fine arts. She's a leading geriatrician, writer, educator, professor of medicine at UCSF, and the author of the New York Times bestseller and Pulitzer Prize finalist uh, for her book, Elderhood, Redefining Aging, Transforming Medicine, and Reimagining Life. She's a graduate of Harvard Medical School and received the Gold Professorship in Humanism and Medicine, the California Home Care Physician of the Year Award, and the American Geriatric Society Clinician Teacher of the Year Award. Her writing credits include her prior book, which was called A History of the Present Illness Stories, as well as articles in the New York Times, Atlantic, Washington Post, Discover, Vox, JAMA, Lancet, and the New England Journal of Medicine. And she's been featured on NPR's Fresh Air Today, CBS This Morning, Morning Edition, Political, Kaiser Health News, Tech Nation, and The New Yorker. And she also has a a TED Talk uh, that I just listened to the other day. And her book is wonderful. I just, I finished it. I mentioned to Louise at the beginning, I read part and then listened to part through Audible. And I heard Louise speak at a program sponsored by NPR and uh, Boston University just before all the COVID stuff started. And I sort of knew at the time that I wanted to invite her so that all of you will be able to have the wealth of her her understanding really of life, aging, medicine, really, it's, it's a wonderful tour de force. I just want to say it's a, just a fabulous book that I think everybody, uh, interested in aging, in how we age, what it's all about, and also how medicine helps and hinders <laughs> really need to read your book as well as just your stories and personal journey. So if, you know, let's start. I always like to ask people, how did you get interested in doing in this field and doing what you're doing? If we could start with that. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> thanks for that introduction. You know, I didn't mean to, uh, which I think happens more often to people in aging than in other things. I thought I probably would do something with children for the longest time, and I did do things with children. And then I guess a few things happened. One is it turns out that when you're a doctor, and I was for my core pediatrics rotation as a medical student um, in the toddler unit at Boston Children's where there were some really sick, really young kids, and they really didn't like to see the doctors coming because we hurt them they liked the nurses. <laughs> so I sort of thought like, wow, my goal in life has not been to torture children, um, which admittedly is not what most pediatricians think they do. But that was kind of my experience of that month. And so then I thought, my goodness, what am I going to do? I I liked working with adults. But what I didn't realize was that my adult rotation had lots of older people. And it was really only in residency that I realized a few things. One is I love stories and people. And the longer you live, the more stories you have. And the older you get, the more I need to know who you are and what you value and who's in your life and where you live in order to take good care of you. Now, one could argue that every patient deserves all that information, but it becomes absolutely essential as you get older. And then there was this huge vacuum where we have hospitals and specialists for kids and adults, but we had so little for older people. Uh, And I started, you know, I would hurt hurt them while giving them the supposedly best care at the best institutions in the country. And I saw other people do that too. And I realized that we actually knew a lot and that we could do so much better. So it was both just the personal pleasure because I happened to 
like older people and the pleasure of a more holistic approach to medical care rather than disease or organ focused and the sense that a person could really make a difference because frankly so little had been done over time for people who need relatively more medical care. So it was kind of a confluence of all those things. Uh, and, but I will say, you know, people will sometimes say like, um, you, you do that really? And we geriatricians are so happy. We always win the happiness award among doctors. So something to it. <laughs> we just need, we need more of you. <laughs> so let's start. Um, it, I mean, it, it, and you talk about some of the background things in the book. And again, I encourage people to, to read your book of, and, and the stories you tell are wonderful. So I'm hoping during our conversation, you know, during this hour that you'll be able to share a little of that too. But when does old age start? Um, and what does old mean? I guess I want to start with both of those questions. <laughs> Well, they're such good questions. Well, old age, it's pretty interesting. So historically, you can go back, you know, three, four thousand years. You can go to all different societies, you know, Persia, China, Rome, Greece, like all the, the great ancient civilizations, India. And they all pretty much say that old age begins between 60 and 70. And that has remained pretty solid throughout history. Occasionally, it has been defined as 75, but that is by far the exception. Now, people in our era will push back on that and say, well, that's not old, because we have come to conflate the word old with what might be called frail or what what might be, you know, what is sort of the latter years of old age. But if you if you ask most people, especially if they're not speaking about themselves, just speaking about other people, they can tell, you know, child from adult from elder. It, that there is that joke book from, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago that old age is always 10 years older than I am. Um, and that phenomenon clearly is, is doing quite well. Uh, but I actually think that the COVID pandemic has shown that putting Putting old age biologically between 60 and 70 makes good sense. When you look at the death rate, it begins to go up just a little in a person's 50s. Then it triples into the 60s. That's the first real significant uptick. Doubles from the 60s into the 70s and about doubles again into the 80s. That is the physiologic changes of aging. Now, I will say the death rate has in part to do with old age and in part to do with our very biased healthcare and public health system. Systems that have responded different, you know, with with a good amount of bias for old people. But yeah, it's uh, the reason I called the book Elderhood is because old age, like childhood and adulthood, is a decades long process with lots of substages. And until we recognize that, we're not going to have a society that really sees old age in its full diversity and all its opportunities as well as its challenges. Can, can you talk more about that? Because, because as, as you say in the book too, that elderhood includes silent generation, boomers, and right. so it's all and all different. And I think that's one of the the beauties of your book, Elderhood. Of and, and if you can just talk a little more, because what what I recall, recall reading is just the sense that we don't lump everybody together in childhood or adulthood. And yet there's such a tendency to want to do that when people are old, you know, like you're old and that's mm-hmm. it. You know? so. If you had a 65 year old standing next to an 85 year old standing next to a 105 year old, even if you've never met them before in your life, you would know that um, they were different and you would almost certainly be able to know which one was in which category. You know, we know there are differences, um, <laughs> but we somehow, you know, think of the language we have for childhood. We have neonate, infant, toddler, young kid, kid, tween, teen, and young adult. And at this point, you've only gone 20 years. Yet if we say legally and biologically a person is old, let's say at 65, we'll pick the middle between 60 and 70 and the legal definition in the United States, why is it we just say that's old and we don't make the same distinctions? Um, also, if you think of somebody in their 20s versus somebody in their 50s, I mean, that's essentially the parent and the child. It's completely different generations. So one of the big arguments about elderhood is not that we do something special or different. It's 
simply that we treat old age in the exact same way we already treat childhood and adulthood. And we acknowledge the many decades and the differences of people in the subcategories of those decades. Now, it's a little problematic for elderhood because we don't know how to use the language and because ageism and internalized ageism are so strong that when you do studies of the various different words for old people or aging, nobody really likes any of them. So you, you could argue for a progression of you're an older adult and then you're a senior and then you're an elder and then you're elderly and then you're aged, for example. That could be one trajectory. But when people are denying all those words, it, it's hard to get anybody used to using them. And when you don't have language, when you don't acknowledge subcategories, then you don't have all kinds of things that you need for those subcategories, which, you know, I talk about a lot in the book about healthcare, but the same is true for clothing because bodies change in old age. We have, <laughs> we have all sorts of different kinds of clothing, but we don't tend to make the, the different clothing for older people. What about parks? You've got the kid area and the adult area. We're just starting to see areas for elders. What about homes where you get all these cute, adorable, colorful, things for kids and these sexy, stylish things for adults. And yet people really want to age in place, but they have trouble doing it because there either aren't the right sorts of equipment and, and, you know, things that they can have in their home. Or if they exist, they're often so ugly that people don't want them. They're almost like they've made them so ugly that they're a stigma rather than something that is both decorative and useful. So why we need subcategories is so that we can have the right policies and opportunities by acknowledging there are lots of different stages. I do like to add one caution to that. A lot of the work in this area has been emphasizing the vitality of older people, you know, and the, the presidential race right now is really is maybe showing just how much septuagenarians are, uh, you know, they are the fa- oh, before COVID were the fastest growing segment of the American workforce and the sort of unretirement or encore career or not retiring because you still feel fine. So that's evident. And at the same time, we're sort of saying, oh, old people are all old people are useless and they live in nursing homes and they're dying of COVID because we don't even have language. We have these weird contradictory conversations all the time about old age. So I think a huge and critical first step is for people who are, you know, people to start owning those words and realizing that, yeah, Nancy Pelosi's old. She's also the most powerful woman in America, right? Yeah, Trump and Biden are old. They're also the two presidential candidates. And when they become frail, because if you live a whole human lifespan, you will become frail before you die. That doesn't mean they're worthless. You know, a, lo- a lot of this is like saying you're only worth something if you're contributing in certain specific ways. That is an adult and ableist um, definition, which basically gets rid of all children, all very old people, all people with any sorts of disabilities, et cetera. Yeah, it, and it's a, it, it is a paradox too when you think about it. If you know, there are so many older people now in the world and in positions of power, and yet so often older people aren't being hired. They're felt, you know, to be over the hill or obsolete, or you know, their skills aren't up to date. It's, a, I mean, it's a real paradox. It is. It has led to a lot of creativity, though. So o- older people, yeah. particularly people in their 70s, are, uh, 60s and 70s, are huge numbers of people in the entrepreneur space, right. as we say these days. And that's because nobody else will hire them, which right. is crazy. I am kind of looking forward to, as Mark Zuckerberg, who, you know, initially said that once you're over 35, you never do anything. <laughs> I'm just kind of really looking forward to seeing what happens next there. Yeah, right. I <laughs> see. <laughs> there. The, the language exactly. stuff is so, so important. Can, and, and I know you spend some time in the book talking about how we other aging. Can you talk a little about that? Sort of what I referenced before where yeah. we were you know, people will say those other people are old or I'm not old. And we, we do it in so many ways. And I think part of the problem with old age is that, I mean, it, does, it for many people, it doesn't make sense, right? Because either you die young or you become old. So you would think we, it would be less open to othering, whereas you're not going to change races. You can change gender, but that's exceptional even now. You can change religion. It doesn't happen very often. And, you know, there are all these lines 
across which we tend to other people. But it seems really self-defeating to other the old because that is your future self. Right. And yet it's pretty much universal. It's, it's done more and less at different times in history. But why might that happen? Well, I think part of it is that we imprint on ourselves as young. I have had so many patients. I mean, almost without exception, people will say, I just feel like me. And then I look in the mirror or I stand up to go do something. And I realize, like, I'm old. Uh, you know, say, who's that guy or who's that woman in the mirror? I feel like in my 50s, I sometimes have that experience, too, where in my head, I'm still 35. But then, you know, if I go running, it's pretty obvious I'm not. Um, you know, there, there are things like that. And I, I read an article once about uh, the music that we know. And, and it tends to be the music we listen to at a certain phase of adolescence. And it doesn't mean you don't like music or keep learning music, but you will know the words to songs, even ones you don't like from a certain phase in your life. And so it does seem like certain things imprint and define us. um, And then we change. But it may also be because we don't have the sociocultural supports, like the rituals, the the sort of celebrations that we have for other other sort of goalposts in life for, for other achievements. Yeah, I suppose there could be the retirement party, but it's not clear that retirement is a good thing necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also not clear that it's a sustainable thing. Through most of human history, it hasn't really existed. It may turn out to be kind of an epiphenomenon of the 20th century in many ways. You know, previously the, you know, the very rich could retire. The, Everybody else kept working, in, and if they couldn't, they either had to be taken in by someone um, who would take care of them, and sometimes that was family, and sometimes it was religious institutions or other, other, you know, the government occasionally throughout history. And other times when they couldn't work, they were just put in the poorhouse with people who were mentally ill or mm-hmm. had other problems. So I think we need to find ways of really thinking about this life stage in in better ways. Like adolescence didn't really exist until the Industrial Revolution. Now we're having this kind of encore career phase, right? This this phase where maybe you don't want to work 60 or 70 hours a week, but you want to do something because we know people who stop doing anything get unhealthy and unhappy for the most part. Sometimes people need a break of a year or two to recover. And so how do we create opportunities that foster people's sense of self and well-being that are possible even if you develop certain disabilities, which you might, but maybe one thing doesn't work and another does. I just feel like we haven't applied to this life stage the same creativity that we have to others, which is both good and bad. It's good in the sense that we have a huge opportunity to sort of define this new, longer, healthier phase of life. And I think you offer, and, and you know, what you say really supports the belief I have, and I think a lot of people who are probably on this call about the importance of connection, engagement, purpose, and meaning. And it doesn't end when, you know, adulthood ends. I mean, it, it's probably, it's part of us through our very last breath. And I think you, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit more of that, of the, just the importance that you found in maybe, you know, you mentioned in some of your stories of the importance of the meaning and purpose. Right. Well, and it's actually interesting because there is something called the U-shaped curve of happiness, Mm -hmm. which is um, that people tend to be fairly happy as kids. And then adulthood is kind of stressful. So happiness goes down, anxiety goes up, and life satisfaction goes down. And then around 160s, all that starts reversing. Anxiety goes down, life satisfaction and happiness go up. And part of that seems to be the, the flip good side of a story that we hear often, like, oh, people have fewer opportunities opportunities. Oh, they can't do as much. Oh, they're, you know, but, but the flip side is, yes, there are, you know, admittedly, there's some physical changes, and some of them are not desirable, you know, and there are often some health challenges that increase as people get older. But having an angel closer to death, which is a challenge of elderhood compared to adulthood and childhood, but being closer to death and having been through so much, people are also better able to prioritize 
So I think part of the happiness and life satisfaction is, yeah, you're doing fewer things, but <laughs> but you're choosing better. You're, you're making better choices. You're making choices to connect. You're making choices for health. You're making choices for satisfaction, which is part of why they go up. And in fact, sometimes having too many choices, you know, sort of this adulthood thing where you could do this, that, and the other leads to more stress. And having some constraints that you don't have to impose on yourself and then feeling confident in your priorities and seeing that ticking clock so that it allows you to invest in those priorities leads to that greater satisfaction and less anxiety. A really important part of the life phase. And I think something we could take advantage of when we're thinking about how do people spend those so-called retirement years. I think this is a good moment also to talk about how the way we have framed retirement has been very much, you know, you could say gendered even. I don't know that that's a stretch. It's about the only paid work counts. And a lot of people, once they've retired, are doing lots of volunteer work with, you know, whether it's with religious communities or other community things. I know in my neighborhood that the people who take care of, we have, we have all these like very cute staircase things with gardens on either side of it because I, you know, on, on the various hills of San Francisco, and those are all maintained by people in their, you know, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell. You know, there are tons of people helping with grandkids. There are people, you know, making life possible in ways that have traditionally been considered women's work. So then they say mm-hmm. these people are a drain on the community, and you're just discounting a whole sector of work that is vital to most families and communities. That's an excellent point. Sort of ties in. Edwin from California said he, it's not a question, but more of a comment and an echo of the topic of this webinar. He says he does retirement coaching and have been advocating for the term elderhood for a long time. He compares elderhood to a buffet or potluck. Within the stage of elderhood is traditional retirement, gig work, full-time, part-time, volunteer work, etc. So I think it. Yeah, that's great. But as you say, too much choice can be confounding, but needing to value whatever mm-hmm. one does. Also, people, nope. people will sometimes pick either ambition, if you're a fortunate mm-hmm. person, or necessity, if you're a less fortunate person, and that will be the guide. And as you get older, you know, you've successfully raised your kids, or maybe, you know, you, mm-hmm. you have enough to get by, you can then disregard the ambition or the necessity more and really think, what do I value most? How do I want to spend my time and my energy as energy gets less? Because definitely people in their 80s and 90s um, have less energy. I, I quote uh, the, the British writer and editor Diana Athill in the book who sort of <laughs> talked about like she – she can do all the same things. It's just she can only do them for so many hours a day, and that's really annoying, you know, as she's approaching 100. It's still really annoying to her, but it's a fact of life. So, um, you know, it's a good problem to have, probably. But, but, but what you're talking about is really embracing our aging rather than being frightened mm-hmm. by it, and but but not being unrealistic about it either, that, you know, biology yeah. does matter, but it's part of it. It's not the whole thing. Well, I think when people deny it, they actually set up the very old age they fear because they're not mm-hmm. making the adaptations and they're not making the plans. And we know that people who adapt are happier and people who plan are more, more likely to get the old age they want and not the old age they fear. So owning it. I also think if people owned it, we would see its diversity. Whereas now, mm-hmm. if somebody's high functioning, you call them not old, even if they're old. That is true. It just reminded me of that story of your mother with the uh, TSA person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Somehow it just came to my to... mind. I if you could share that. Yeah, I had forgotten about that. I can't quite remember how old she was, although maybe it was after my father died. She must have been late 70s, 80, 80, 81. I think, he said, like I think so. he said early 80s or something, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because she turned 80 shortly after he died. Yeah. yeah, so she's she's going on her first trip and she's walking through the things because once you're over 75, you don't have to take off your shoes. So she hasn't taken off her shoes. And the guard said, ma'am, you've got to go back and take off your shoes. And she said, no, I don't. And he said, yes, ma'am, you do. And and she said, no, I don't. I'm, you know, I'm old. I don't have to take off my shoes. <laughs> and and he's he's sort of like, well, how old are you? And so she says 81 or 82 or whatever she was. And and he's just like, 
oh my God, I can't believe it, you know, or like, how is that possible? He's completely incredulous and thrilled that somebody could look the way my mother looked at 81 or 82. And I think that speaks to a few things that we assume 81 or 82 is decrepit, and it isn't always. And also, a person working for TSA is likely to be a less fortunate person in the world than my mother, and less fortunate people age more quickly. I will say that in my clinic, people who have had harder lives for reasons of race and economics and all kinds of other things tend to start calling themselves old much sooner and say, well, I'm 70 now, I can't, blah, 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 blah. Whereas the more fortunate people will be like... I know I'm 85, but this is ridiculous. You know, my time is now shorter on blah, 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 blah. blah. You know, like, why can't I do this, that, and the other? I mean, there, there is a really different sense of when you expect to have challenges and, and how you deal with them. And it may be in his life, you know, people much more rarely because because we know living into a healthy old age really correlates with economics and advantages so maybe he just hadn't really had that experience so i think it also speaks to some of the tragedies in our society yeah well that's an that's an excellent inequities yeah but in our society we prize youth and i think you I have a quote of you saying that we prize youth and doing so means that all of us will spend most of our lives in a state of failure. I I just found that pretty powerful. (laughs) Yeah, because kind of by the time you, I don't know, I feel like by the time you realize that's happening, the game's over. So you're, you're Mm. you're not young for very long. It's a little bit on the eye of the beholder, but in one of my talks, I always make the joke about the retreat for the the sort of stress relief retreat for older workers in Silicon Valley. There was an article in the Times a couple years ago, and you had to be 30 or older to go to be an older worker in Silicon Valley. So, you know, so it really does depend, but, but you, I mean, Generally, it's considered to be done, it, it's relative, but true youth is done by maybe 25. So if on average we live to 75 or 85, that means the vast majority of our lives were in this category that is, you know, less attractive and less desirable. But if you speak to most people, most people don't want to be 16 again. I mean, there's some people who do, but, but not really. And th- there's the sense that over the hill is bad. But if you think of the human life as either a bell-shaped curve if you're more sort of scientifically inclined or a narrative arc, if, if you're, you know, more creatively inclined. Thank you. But what I, it might be good to shift a little now to, to really talking about sure. some of the medicalization of aging, because I know you talk a lot about mm-hmm. that, that, you know, it used to be so much more of a natural process and, you know, it was an accomplishment if people survived. And now behaviors, bodily functions, physical states, everything that were once considered natural, you know, more natural are given diagnosis, management, treatment. And you spend a good part of the book really talking about how the medical establishment both helps but hurts. And so I wondered if you could speak about that. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's it's very much a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, we're living so much longer because of medicine, because of public health also. But so, you know, broadly written, medicine and public health changes have enabled more of us to live much longer and also in many cases much healthier, you know, for, for more years. So that's good. But what we've sort of done in the 20th century as medicine began to really accelerate in what it could do to help people is that it it prevented a variety of diseases that used to kill people and kill people pretty quickly. And in so doing, it created a situation where a lot of people have a lot of chronic diseases for a long time. And it didn't really allow for the longer lifespan. You know, it, it saved lives, but it didn't think about what those lives would be like or whether they would need different things, you know, as you lived into your 80s or 90s and, and as things changed. So, and, and now in medicine, so we basically ended up with this healthcare system that is very focused on sick people on diseases. So it's not really a healthcare system. At this point, I would say that's a misnomer. The the healthcare system is not set up to care for your health. What it is, is set up to care for your disease. And actually, it is incentivized to have you get sick. So the more sick you get, the better. And in fact, fields of medicine are paid, you know, that if, if people, you know, a hospital 
system wants you to be in the hospital. You don't want to be in the hospital, right? You want outpatient care that keeps you out of the hospital. But the medical system gets paid much more the sicker you are. If you need intensive care, better still. So we have this crazy incentive based on how much fun it was for people to be curing diseases and coming up with new solutions. And they didn't really pay attention to the consequences. There was also the, this hero routine that came in. And of course, it's amazing to be able to save lives. You know, people who would have died automatically are alive, but we just don't put equal care into what happens afterwards. And, and you see this in many different contexts. Yes, with old age, but also with all the people who now serve survive wars, you know, look at Iran and you know, look at Iraq and, and, you know, you have these gravely debilitated people and, you know, it took a while before anybody thought like, what do you do to help them? How, how do you help? And that's sort of similar to what we've done with, with much of old age. And we still sort of make older people second class citizens. So, you know, for example, as I said earlier, we've got children's hospitals and adult hospitals because we know that children's bodies are different. So you give the same dose of a drug to a 40 year old and a four year old and the four year old's liable to get really sick because their body's much smaller because their metabolism is different because their immune system is different. Well, we actually know there are similar differences between the 40 year old and the 80 year old. And yet the 80 year old gets or has been until just recently treated just as the 40 year old was. And you see this in a variety of ways. So, for example, in medical research, the, the research that really defined the 20th century started happening, you know, in mostly in the second half, but by the middle. And so in the 80s, they discovered that when you, you did a study and you said, well, we're only going to have men in it because women are different. They have these funny hormones, you know, there's just no explaining what that might do to the data. So they would get the results on the men and then they'd apply it to the women and the women wouldn't have the same health outcomes because as the initial assumption was, they were different. So in the 80s, the National Institute of Health, then by far the hugest funder of medical research, said, okay, look, if you're going to apply the results to women and people of color, you need to include them in your trials. And then in the 90s, they discovered kids were different, so they required inclusion of kids in trials for drugs and procedures that you're going to do on kids. But <laughs> they didn't require older people in trials of drugs mm -hmm. and procedures used on older people until last year, mm -hmm. so 2019. Yeah. yeah even though older people disproportionately use health care. So they're about 17% of the population in the United States. This obviously varies. I know you have people from different countries, but I can I can quote the U.S. off the top of my head and not the others so well. But but in the U.S., you know, 17% of the population, but depending on the hospital, you know, it could be 25 to 55% of hospital admissions and depending on the specialty service. You know, like if, if you do urology, that's mostly older men. And if you do neurology, it's mostly older people. If you do ophthalmology, it's mostly people in the second half of life. So there are all these ways in which older results are part of this. And what would happen was you'd apply the results and the older people would do less well. And instead of saying, oh, it's because we didn't include them in trials, we've already seen this happen with kids and women and people of color. Um, oh, it's because they're old. <laughs> you know, So you blame old age and it just becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, you would also see old age just discounted. So for vaccines, for example, this is very pertinent now with COVID, right. um, you, vaccine, we make some stages like you get which vaccines when depending on both your biology and the likely social behavior. So, you know, you don't need vaccines that help with sexually transmitted diseases in a two-year-old or six-year-old, you know, except for, you know, something truly horrific right. happens to that child. So we have 17 subcategories for kids. We have five subcategories for adults, and we have 65 plus as a single category, which encompasses a half century of life and proven vast immunological and socio-behavioral differences, you know, with abundant data going back many decades. That's blatant mm -hmm. discrimination. And then when old people are more likely to, for instance, you know, pre-COVID flu, big killer at this time right. of year, and almost all deaths are in old people. 
And yet there was this one until we, until the last decade, there was a single flu shot and elders got the same shot right. as adults. Now we have one that's four times stronger for elders and leads to less pneumonia, less hospitalization and less death. We also have one that has an adjuvant, which makes it stronger, same outcomes. Mm-hmm. This is something we've been doing for mm-hmm. kids since the 1950s. And now we're doing it for, for elders. Yeah. That's discrimination. It's discrimination and it's just, you know, it is amazing to realize, you know, how the medical system, you know, perpetuates itself in the the same way when you're talking about hospitals, you know, being able to, you know, they get rewarded, you know, for medical procedures when people are inpatient. Uh, You mentioned in the book, and maybe it'd be helpful for the um, listeners, it's part of why there's so few geriatricians, just the amount that different specialties get paid. And the fact, I I think you mentioned that that not that many schools even teach gerontology classes. Is that still the case in medical school? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, um, so, so it's better. You know, like right. at UCSF now, they get a few weeks, but you get months of pediatrics and years of adult medicine, and at best, a few weeks of medicine for older adults, even though I just gave you the disproportional share of youth. Right. And part of it is that it's it's so entrenched. I mean, it's basically structural ageism in the way we're hearing about structural racism. And, you know, it's, it's so baked in that people, really well-meaning people, mess it up. They just don't get it and they don't see it. And part of that is if they've never learned, they don't know the difference. And and so it becomes this self-perpetuating thing. And also because people don't feel comfortable treating older people because they haven't been taught to do that. You know, part, part of why people go into medicine is they want to feel useful and they want to be good at something. You know, it's it has parts vocation, parts trade, part, you know, all these things. So if you're not taught to do something, then you don't do it very well. Then you know you're not doing it very well. Then you don't like doing it. So you will hear people say, well, I don't like taking care of older people. Older people are so complex. You can actually be taught how to do that. And people who are taught how to do that enjoy doing it. But so it just, it goes on and on and on. And then the bar gets so low so that now there's this thing called age-friendly health systems, which sounds great, but but it's still second-class citizenship. You know, if you go into a children's hospital, it's made to be really accessible to shorter people, <laughs> you know, which is, you could argue mm-hmm. kids are short adults, right? You know, that's sort of what we do with older people, you know, and in adult hospitals, you have things for adults, but we don't really have a place for older people unless you would call it a nursing home, which is not really a place anybody looks forward to going because it's not resourced in the same way. And it's not designed mm-hmm. for, you know, the pleasure and opportunity that the other places are. Uh, and this age-friendly health system just means you can continue with your adult-focused everything, your adult-focused building, your adult-focused specialist, everything else, as long as you pay attention to, you just add a little more attention to medications in old people, mentation, so cognition, mobility, and what matters. So four things. Everybody else gets, you know, buildings and specialists and subspecialists, and old people get people paying somewhat attention to these four things. And they're big buckets, admittedly. But it's just, I think it's a sellout and it's a second-class citizenship Mm. issue. It's so frustrating since, you know, people 65 and older are just, you know, increasingly you know, a big part of this country. <laughs> I mean, the world, even not just yeah. our country. But they're I mean, making a different world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But but it is actually making a difference. So when I started as a geriatrician like 25 years ago, there would be nothing in the public press about older people. You know, mm. I might see something a couple times a year. And then maybe 10, 15 years ago, it got to be a couple times a month, and then it was a couple times a week. And now I literally can't keep up with the amount of stuff. And Rich Eisenberg of Next Avenue explained this on a program we were on together. He explained it really nice. Nicely, you know, because you could you could say the generational differences between the silent generation, you know, is is silent, so that actually doesn't lead to equity very well. And the great generation is known for being sort of stoic and being able to take a lot. But baby boomers, I loved when he said this. He was mm-hmm. like, you know, when we were young, people thought it was about, you know, we were all about youth, but it turns out we were all about ourselves, and now we're old. <laughs> 
So, you know, so making noise. And I do think right. that's having an impact mm-hmm. and seeing it everywhere. I mean, when I was young, you never saw really things about older people. But what we're finding, mm-hmm. especially maybe in Generation Z youth, is they're really interested in aging and older people in a mm-hmm. way the millennials simply were not. So I do think we're making some progress. And the greater visibility is good. We just have to make sure that the visibility tells all the messages, you know, so it shows the wide range. And you don't just right. think, you know, when I do talks, whether it's to the public or to a bunch of medical students, I'll say, what percentage of older people live in nursing homes? Oh, people think it's 50, it's 70, it's 90. Well, it's like 2%, 1 to 2%. It's tiny. So somehow we have to tell all these stories and also own that some of these stories are about old age so people understand the full diversity. But we also can't do this thing that, that happened on a program I was on on Saturday night where people were like, yeah, yeah, old people are so much more vigorous now. If you use vigor as your sole criterion for value, then eventually all of us become failures. You know, we, we become useless people. What you need to do is instead, you know, we don't fault a toddler for not having a job. And, you know, I don't want to necessarily compare a frail old person with dementia to a toddler. But the fact is, there is an arc of life. And in the very later stages, as in the very earlier stages, people usually don't have the capacity to contribute. It's the time in between. That is the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, And if we gave, you know, we we also live in this society where people say, oh, you know, we're not going to employ older people. You know, they they should retire and get out of the way. And then with the same breath, they say, and older people are no good and they're not contributing to the economy. Well, you cannot have it both ways. So we need lots more opportunities for people to satisfactorily contribute while they can, and we need to not blame them for being alive when they no longer can and to get a little bit of credit for time served and for just being, you know, an animal and an animal, you know, is less functional at the beginning and the end of its life. That's simply the way it is. Well said. (laughs) You you also (laughs) write that (laughs) you, you say that care is never futile, though treatment can be. Can you yes. talk about that? Because I, I think sometimes oh, I people that you use the term uh, yeah. interchangeably. Yes. Right. Um, exactly. There's this yeah. horrible term called withdrawal of care, which is just horrible. Horrible. So what that means is when treatment has become futile, you know, maybe the person's never going to get off the bleeding machine or maybe the person's brain dead and, you know, whatever. So, so that was initially called withdrawal of care, but it's not withdrawal of care. You might be stopping the bleeding machine. You might be moving to comfort only, but Oh, sorry, dog shaking. Um, so that, but, but that is still care. You can always care. Care is an emotion. It's an interaction. And in the context of medicine, it is anything that helps the person who is in the role of patient. So you may be stopping the chemo because it's doing lots of harm and no good. But you don't need to stop caring for the patient. You work on their comfort. You see what it is they want to do in their remaining time. So we can't use those, you know, yeah, so treatment, procedures, medications, et cetera, those can sometimes become futile, useless, even harmful. But care is never any of those things. Care is always helpful, whether to the patient or to the family. You can always do more with care and and do it better. So we really have to be careful of language in that way. I mean, it's kind of like this healthcare medicine thing. There's so many ways in which we use language in ways that are counter to what the ultimate goal should be Mm. for people. I want to turn to, there's a bunch of comments and questions from people. So let me sort of see the time. So Larry from Wisconsin says, often we talk about what we can do for people and we're concerned about what people think about us. How do we get people to take responsibility that they're creating their own life or that they're creating in their life. He says, I teach a course called Refire, Don't Retire, which attempts to change people's view of retirement and show them the benefit of being of service to our el- in our elder years. My perspective is that we own the problem and our mindset has a lot to do with how fulfilled we are in our elder years of being of service. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm working a lot on this. I started uh, an a, an integrative aging practice, and I'm working on a project called Age Self Care. That's an acronym. 
but it's mm-hmm. based on um, this abundant data from Becca Levy at Yale, who I talk about in the book and others, that internalized ageism actually leads to not only less happiness, but worse health. So if you're not comfortable calling yourself old or you think old age is just miserable, you actually will die of heart attacks and strokes seven and a half years earlier. You're more likely to have Alzheimer's markers in your cerebrospinal fluid. You're less likely to recover well from an illness or hospitalization. Um, And there is this sense, and we see this a lot. I work with a lot of community organizations in San Francisco where people consider themselves older people who, who are part of organizations consider themselves either on the volunteer end or the recipient end. Whereas in fact, throughout life, we're always, almost without exception, both giving and needing help. You know, you might be good at this, you might be good at computers, but you can't cook or vice versa. And right now, both are quite useful. So part of what we're working on in age self-care is for people doing what, what you mentioned earlier, which was adaptation. Like, this part is true. You're not going to probably run another four minute mile. And yet, you can still exercise. And if you do exercise, it is the only treatment we know of that treats diabetes, high blood pressure, prevents dementia, treats cancers, heart disease, insomnia, depression, anxiety, Parkinson's, I could go on and on and on. Um, And even if you have disability, you can do sorts of exercise. You can also have agency. So I think we train people. And I tell a story, actually, I pull from Vivian Gornick's book, Odd Woman in the City, but... uh, a story about how assumptions can really lead to outcomes. So if people feel they have more agency, they feel okay to speak up. They see that they have power. Like one of the, the best moments in the last that we, we finished an iteration of this course in August and we had one woman participating who has, you know, is basically wheelchair and bed bound at this point. But other people were were working on planning and thinking forward and thinking how to help others. And she knew a lot about how do you make a home disability friendly so that she could continue to be an independent person. And so there was this moment where she just came to life and be, began teaching the others about what they could do to their homes. And this sounds good, but it really doesn't work. And, you know, so, so, even in, in extreme situations, people have things to offer. And this notion that you don't really harms yourself and deprives the community of all the things you can offer. So uh, I'm encouraging people to to have greater self-efficacy, to, to own that they are you know, that they have rights, you know, that they can have pleasures and needs like anyone else and to take more responsibility for their own aging, planning it, working on their own health, all those things, because it not only achieves the goal, it feels good having done it yourself rather than being Mm -hmm. um, dependent before you need to be. And at some point where, you know, we almost all of us reach a point of dependency. So that can't be an evil But I think there's something, there's a phenomenon in medicine we call learned dependence, which is when we train people like, okay, you do this more slowly than I do, so I'm just going to do it for you. Instead of like, does it really need to be done in two seconds? Probably not. Keep doing it yourself. It feels good and it gets the job done. Excellent, excellent points. Yeah. So Mary from California says, she asked if you'll respond to this comment that there are diseases that predominantly affect people over 50 and more into their 60s plus, like Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Regarding Parkinson's, there are very few motion disease experts in the neurology field. My hunch is that MDs are not going into these specialties because the main payer is Medicare and that docs are going into fields that provide a higher opportunity for making money in their careers. This is a policy issue that fails to serve older adults. Will you comment? Oh, such a good point. Yes. So on a positive, the fee for service as percentage of healthcare dollar is going down. That was the arena in which doctors treating certain kinds of diseases and in certain locations. That's what I was referencing earlier. You know, better that you're sick, better that somebody takes care of your bone than your child, right? So if you break your arm, the person who sets your arm or repairs your arm will make in a year three to five times more than the pediatrician 
who cares for your child or then the psychiatrist who cares for something which is so much harder to treat, like schizophrenia. So so the system is rigged, but as fee-for-service goes down, people's ability to milk it for profit goes down. So that's a good thing. For example, there are doctors like me. I have always been in a position where I'm salaried. What I do for my patients doesn't either increase or decrease, right? You have the managed care setting where sometimes doctors are incentivized not to provide certain kinds of care. So what I have always wanted was a career in which my salary was was separate from mm. what I did for my patients. So I'm not I'm not rewarded in either direction. What I, I try to do is what's best for the patient. And I think all of healthcare really needs to be that way to some degree, right? And we've also seen that capitalism seems to flourish regardless of what people are trying to do or calling it or, you know, various other mechanisms don't work so well. And, you know, while doctors will complain, and I use doctor salaries in my book, not as a way of complaining like, oh, poor me as a doctor, I'm not getting paid enough. But the fact that a pediatrician is paid so little and like a dermatologist who's mostly doing cosmetic things can literally make 10 times more than a person who's responsible for sick kids. To me, that's obscene. That That is a value structure that is broken. And it's true that, that because people, especially in fee-for-service, don't want to take Medicare, there's some disincentive. And, and what adds to that also is that as we have a society that's more equitable, where people from all backgrounds can go to medical school, you've got people who emerge with two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars of educational debt. So there, we could also create an incentive system where you didn't have to become an orthopedist or a dermatologist or a radiologist, where you could become a psychiatrist or a neurologist specializing in movement disorders or something else, mm-hmm. and your your loans would be forgiven. So there's so many ways in which the healthcare system actually promotes our bodies being parsed so that, mm-hmm. for instance, it's not just that you become a neurologist, but you become a Parkinson's disease specialist, or you become a, you know, a sub-sub-sub-specialist in, instead of providing the more holistic care that most people need to thrive. So I completely agree that our healthcare system is broken and that we need to somehow restructure it so that the people who need care and the care proven to be most helpful in a human life is valued more. And the things that certain doctors have fun doing, like sticking tubes in people, is valued less. Just because that's fun doesn't mean we should incentivize it. We should rather be keeping people from needing those tubes stuck in them. And we actually know how to do that. And most countries do that better than the United States. We are ranked 37th in health outcomes. Now, if you need intensive care, this is a great country to be in. But if you actually just want to be a healthy citizen, this is not the country for you. Mm-hmm. That's sad. <laughs> but, Isn't it? Um, yeah. It and we really end up is. fighting about yeah. weird, you know, it, it gets into this Republican Democrat thing where mm-hmm. I think all human beings should value health of themselves, their families and others. Right. So Meg from Massachusetts says, do you think a widespread fear or denial of death may be part of the reason for the aversion to treating the elderly as well as to becoming old? Mm, Yeah, I mean, you know, childhood ends in adulthood and adulthood ends in elderhood and elderhood ends in death. So that is probably a problem. In some ways, though, death has become a little more popular than aging. I think aging is beginning to catch up. But around the turn of the century, people were getting more comfortable with death and there were books and TV shows about it. But yeah, there, there, you know, death has scared people from most civilizations throughout time. But you know, and, and it's not something most people look forward to unless they're gravely ill, mentally or otherwise. So I do think that's a challenge. But I also think when you can't talk about something, it becomes much scarier. We know, looking across cultures and, and back in time, that in in places where it was just normal, you know, where people died in the home, where people knew how to take care of people who were dying. I get called by people in all different other health insurance things, people who've met me or friends of friends to help people die when they're home because the family won't know how to provide basic care Mm -hmm. in a way that most of us, once we reach adulthood, we have a sense for how to care for kids. But we really need to learn how to provide care 
across the life continuum. And if we were more comfortable with that, it would seem less onerous. It's again, that thing where if you know how to do something, it's less scary. And if you can talk right. about it, we also spoke earlier about language. I'm sort of endlessly shocked right. when I have colleagues who will talk about somebody passing away. I'm like, look, you're a doctor. Right. If you can't say the word death, right. then we have a real problem in society. And the fact is we die. We all die. There is that big joke of, you know, medicine's getting better and human mortality is holding steady at one. 100%. So we need to be able to say death because we will all die. And in fact, the more you can say death and talk about death, there is a lot of data on this, the more likely you are to get a death you want and not to get a death that you fear and dread. Also, when doctors don't use the word death, families are sometimes shocked when their loved one dies. They said, well, I thought you said they were just really sick. You know, and the doctor's using that as as a euphemism for death because the doctor, him or herself, is not comfortable using the word death. You just have to, like, it's, you know, if you just use these words, they lose their power and they get easier. You know, I did that with old for myself. If if you read the book, you'll see that part of why I was able to write it was I entered my 50s and I started making jokes about aging, or maybe even a little before that. And I suddenly thought, I am such a hypocrite and I am not helping And also, I recognize that all those things are normal. You know, it's being part of our culture. But I literally trained it out of myself, and and it can be done. So that I'll say, you know, I'll say to students or to other people something about being old. And I'm in my 50s, you know, later 50s now. But people often want to say, oh, you're not old. But, you know, if you said, oh, you know, my child's still young, he's only six, they wouldn't say, oh, he's not young. It's only because we think of old as an insult instead of a statement of fact. It's a statement of fact. And you can really demystify it by just using these words. And you can make yourself more comfortable with it. And and I have to say that the the de-stressing of one's life and the options that opens up, I highly recommend. Excellent advice too. This this may be the well. I I know we have to stop in just a moment because you said you could just go a couple of minutes over. But yeah, on the other point of it, Louise says, what are some of the most success, successful strategies you've seen people choose to age with joy? Mm, that's a good question. I think you know, and this is people of all different backgrounds. Is really thinking about what they pri- what what matters most to them, like, and and who matters most to them. There are some great happiness studies which show that pretty much across ages and levels of income, happiness comes with having a few really treasured relationships. And some people have, you know, dozens or hundreds, you know, but but it's really about those few close people. It's, it's also about thinking about what makes you feel good and what makes you feel well. And those are two slightly different things. Well is feeling okay in your body, less pain, less fatigue, less stress. What are those activities? And then what makes you feel good is what makes you feel happy or worthy. So people do best if they have a purpose in life. And the purpose can be something big or small. It can be something sort of self-focused, like I'm going to learn Swahili. I'm going to become a, the painter I always wanted to be, but I, you know, took a job, you know, as an accountant because I wanted to have a family and support that family. It can be I'm going to help my sister who has dementia because she really never wanted to go into a home and I'm going to make sure she doesn't have to or if she does, it's at a point where she she no longer knows knows that that's what's happening to her. There's so many ways to fill a day with purpose or I've never, I've always been kind of heavy, you know, I've never really been much of an athlete but I know that at any age, Getting more active can make a person feel healthier. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to get up and every day I'm going to walk. And every week I'm going to walk a little further. There's so many, it's it's as individual as we are, but it's about picking some priorities, having a purpose, and really pursuing those things and allowing yourself to be different than you were. An anecdote Mm -hmm. I've, I've grown fond of telling is, was actually told to me by a reporter some months ago, but he said in his neighborhood, there was a guy that I, I guess he'd lived in the neighborhood for decades. There was a guy that that was known. Like when they moved in, he heard about this guy. He'll go out running really early and he won't come back for a few hours. So that was when the guy was in his seventies. And then at some point in his eighties, the guy started going out early on his bike and coming back a few hours later. And now the man is in his nineties and he goes walking in the morning and he comes back a few hours later. 
So he had to adjust because he was getting older, mm-hmm. but he recognized mm-hmm. two things that really mattered to him. He needed to be outside to be happy and he loved to be active and he had to do it mm-hmm. first thing in the morning. So he's still doing it first thing in the morning. What he's doing has changed, but he's still active and he's still outside. And it's that kind of adaptation. Like, yes, I'm 90 now. Things are different. Mm-hmm. And there is still a way for me to do what I value. So so it's that kind of thing. That's obviously like an exceptional, you know, an extreme case mm-hmm. of that. Even on the smallest of scale, that leads people to happiness. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful action. example. Lovely mm-hmm. example. So we're going to pull it together. And Edwin, if you send me your address, I will get that to Louise. Uh, and Meg from Cambridge says... I wish we could clone you. (laughs) Get all the young people you know excited. Because seriously, if they're interested in science, geroscience is the cutting edge of science. If they're interested in tech, this is an area. If they're interested in anything like designing clothing, this is like a whole untapped market. Like really anything anybody wants to do, whether they're young or actually in their encore career, this is the biggest Mm -hmm. growing market. There is opportunity for creativity and fun and the satisfaction is enormous. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I know I've kept you a little longer. I hope you're not going to be too late here. I told them I yeah. might be late. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so true to my thank word. you so, yeah. so much for being with us. And I do, as I said, recommend your book to to everybody. I, I, it's just and I, I it's just been a joy having you with us today. So thank you so much and. I look forward to reading more of your articles and, you know, seeing you, you did the TED Talk. I just wanted to remind people if they want to take a look at that. And thank you so much. And, and maybe you'll come back another time, I hope. So. Okay, that'd be fun. It was um, great <laughs> questions and, and nice group. So I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And there were other questions I, or comments I wasn't able to include just because of time. But thanks okay. again. Stay well and safe in these very challenging times. So yeah, take you care. Too. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com. 